Hi there. My name's Philip, and I'm an historical interpreter at the Hamilton Museum of Steam and Technology. I have one of the best jobs in the world because I get to help preserve and share the history of Hamilton's first pumping station. Built more than 160 years ago in 1859, it still stands here as a testament to the triumph of ingenuity and determination in the face of fear, fire, and waterborne disease. The construction of this pump house marks the beginning of the Hamilton Waterworks, which to this day still provides the city of Hamilton with clean, safe water for drinking, fire prevention, and lots of other things. Our engines pumped water from Lake Ontario to a reservoir on the escarpment. From there, the water flowed down through water pipes to people's homes and businesses. Today, we're going to explore the journey that water took through the 1859 waterworks in what I like to call the trip of the dream. Welcome to the museum. We're standing in the boiler house where the steam to power our engine was produced. Behind me is a beautiful painting called From Lake to Home. We're going to use it as a map to explore the journey that water took through the 1859 waterworks. We'll start in Lake Ontario, a vast source of fresh water, but it's got lots of things in it that I wouldn't want in my drinking cup. Fish, algae, seaweed, and lots of things I can't see, like bacteria that could make me sick. Even in 1859, they understood that the water would need to be cleaner before it was fit to drink. So they dug a deep trench called the infiltration basin inside the shore, separated from the lake by a sand barrier. Lake water would filter through the sand, cleaning it out. From the infiltration basin, the water would flow through a pipe to a suction well here at the pump house, where massive steam engines would pump the water five kilometers to the southwest and 60 meters up to a reservoir capable of holding more than 50 million liters of water. The reservoir was connected to the city's homes, businesses, fire hydrants, and fountains by a series of branching water pipes, so that whenever you turned on a faucet or a hydrant in the city, water from the reservoir flowed out. After the completion of the waterworks, the city erected a beautiful cast iron fountain in Gore Park to celebrate their achievement. We're going to take a look at three important points on our map through a series of activities that you can try at home. First, we're going to look at the infiltration basin and ask how effective was that in cleaning the water. Next, we're going to look at how pumping water to an elevated reservoir would be able to provide ample and consistent water pressure to an entire city of people. Finally, we're going to ask how were engines capable of pumping more than 11 million liters of water a day made in 1859? Let's get started. In 1859, Hamilton's water was filtered through natural beach sand. How effective was that at cleaning the water, and how does it compare to more modern filtration methods? To find out, we're going to take a look at three different filters to see how well they can clean some pretty dirty water. You can follow along with our experiment at home, or you can join in by testing your own at-home water filters. Just remember that no matter how clean the filtered water looks, it may still contain harmful bacteria that can make us sick, so don't drink your results. We're going to be using some simple materials that you can find around the house or outside. To start, you'll need a 2 liter bottle for each filter you plan to make. Be sure to have an adult cut it in half for you. We're also going to need some filtering materials. We're using pebbles, sand, and activated carbon, charcoal. But you can feel free to experiment with other materials as well, like beads, cloth, or paper towel. Finally, we're going to need some dirty water to clean. And for that, we're just using a mixture of water and potting soil. Once you have everything you need, you're going to take the top of one of your 2 liter bottles and turn it upside down so it makes a funnel, and place it inside the bottom of your bottle. Our first filter is just going to be sand. This will be the closest to the 1859 sand filter. We are going to put a little mesh at the bottom of our filter just to keep the sand from flowing out. Our next filter is going to be a little more complex. This is going to be more similar to the way that we filter water today. We'll start by putting a little pouch of activated carbon at the bottom. 
This is just little flakes of charcoal that act like tiny sponges to filter out and absorb tiny impurities in the water. Then we're going to add our sand. And finally, we're going to add some pebbles. That'll filter out the coarser debris. Our water's going to have to pass through all three of these layers. Our final filter is actually a household filter that you can buy online and that some of you may even have in your own home. These filters are not designed to filter out raw lake water, but actually to filter already clean water and remove trace minerals and substances. Let's add our dirty water and see what happens. Get a little stir. This process could take a while, so let's check back in a few minutes. While we're waiting for our filters, let's take a closer look at one of these household filters to see what's inside. If we remove the top, we can see that there's four holes covered by a layer of fine mesh. And beneath that is a bunch of these black and white granules. In fact, the entire filter is just filled with these black and white granules and then there's another layer of fine mesh at the bottom, presumably to keep those granules inside the filter. Now, what are these granules? Well, the black ones are just activated charcoal, like what we have in our second filter. And the white ones are actually a type of ionizing resin that help remove some kinds of dissolved minerals from your water, like lime, copper, or lead. Let's check back in on our filters. So as we can see, our water's gone through our filters and collected at the bottom and they all look cleaner. This is our sand filter water, this is our three layer filter water, and this is our household filter water. Now, it seems like the three layer filter has done a slightly better job than the sand alone filter, but none of them are clean enough to drink. And that's because filtration is only part of the process. The water would also undergo a process called sedimentation. We can learn more about sedimentation by mixing some soil and water. So as I pour the water in, it's gonna get churned up and very quickly it's gonna turn into a real muddy mess. Something that I don't think anyone would wanna drink. But if we let this sit for a little while, something pretty amazing is gonna happen. Let's take a closer look. So here's the water we mixed up a moment ago. As you can see, it's really dark and murky, but if we allow it to sit for long enough, the soil will settle to the bottom of the container or float to the top where it can be skimmed off, leaving cleaner water behind. Now that process takes a lot longer than we have right now, so we're going to look at one that we made yesterday. As you can see, the soil has largely floated to the top of the container. That's because we're using potting soil, which contains a lot of expansive materials that like to float. There's also a lot that settled to the bottom, and the water in the center is relatively clear. If we allow it to sit for even longer, it'll continue to clarify. Now in 1859, these two processes were enough to provide reasonably clean water to the city of Hamilton, but harmful bacteria could still be passed through the water system. That's why today, in addition to filtration and sedimentation, the Hamilton Water Works constantly monitors our water supply and adds trace amounts of antibacterial chemicals like chlorine before distributing it to the city. Now that we filtered our water, it will be pumped up the escarpment to the reservoir. How did they do this? Well, I have a pump here that I'm going to use to move this water, which I've dyed blue, from the container on my left to the container on my right. And hopefully, by taking a closer look at how this pump works and seeing it in action, we'll be able to answer that question. This pump is composed of a tube with a cap on each end, a plunger, which is a disc at the end of a rod, and two valves which are little doors that water can push through, but only in one direction. One of the valves is just inside the bottom cap, and the other is in the plunger. 
Now, if we look closely, we'll also see that the pump has two openings, one at the top and one at the bottom, to which we can attach our pipes. These will allow water to enter and exit the pump. Taking a look at our diagram, we can see that as the plunger moves down, water inside the pump forces close the valve on the plunger, preventing water from passing through it. The valve at the bottom of the pump is forced open by the water being pushed on by the plunger, allowing it to exit the pump and enter the pipe. Now, as the plunger moves down, the space above the plunger is increasing in size, and so water is drawn from our source to fill it. As the plunger moves back up, water from the pipe is prevented from re-entering the pump because it's forcing close the valve at the bottom of the pump. Meanwhile, the valve on the plunger allows water to freely pass from the space above the plunger to the space below it until the plunger reaches the top of the pump and the cycle starts again. Let's see it in action. There we go. We're pumping water. Now, using a pump similar to this one, water would have been pumped 60 meters up the escarpment. The reason they did this was to take advantage of gravity to provide water pressure. We're going to explore this idea a little more with another cool activity. I have here a tube open on the top with a pipe protruding from the bottom and I've taken a balloon at the end of the pipe. That's going to give us a visual representation of the water pressure at the base of the tube. Now many of you will already be familiar with the concept of water pressure if you've ever tried swimming to the bottom of a swimming pool to touch the bottom. You can feel the pressure increase in your ears. What might not be immediately obvious though is that the increase in pressure has nothing to do with the volume of water in the pool, just its depth. A taller column of water weighs more, and so the pressure at its base is greater. Now, as we fill the tube and the balloon expands, the pressure inside the balloon will increase, and it will be able to balance a taller and taller column of water. Now, a 50 centimeter column of water doesn't produce a lot of pressure at its base, but it's more than enough to expand this balloon. In fact, the slight increase in pressure is very likely to burst it. Which is why I'm standing outside with my shoes off. Let's fill this up. Now our reservoir is 120 times higher than this column, which means that the pressure provided to the city of Hamilton is up to 120 times greater. That's five times as high as the pressure of the air around us. Now if I were to remove the pipe now, what we'd see is a steady stream of water with a gradually declining pressure coming out of the bottom of the tube as the height of the column falls. But because I have the balloon here on the end, it's going to expand to absorb that pressure. Now the more it expands, the more it resists continued expansion. So it's going to increase the pressure inside the balloon and that's going to be able to balance a taller and taller column of water. Since I've started filling, this balloon has already gotten quite a lot larger. But if we stop filling, we can see that the water is only balanced to a height of just over 25 centimeters. We can go double that height, so let's see how much we can how much pressure this balloon can withstand. After all that, our balloon is supporting a column of water a little more than 35 centimeters high now. 45 centimeters. Getting close. So we didn't quite get to 50 centimeters, but we got pretty close and I think the result was pretty satisfying regardless. But remember, the reservoir we pumped to in 1859 was 120 times higher than this column, which means it provided a much greater pressure, even when the pumps weren't running, which is why we would pump to the reservoir instead of directly to the city. Now that we understand just how much water was pumped and how much pressure it can exert, 
can start to see why it was so important to use very strong metal engines, pumps, and pipes to deliver the water to the reservoir. How did they make such large, strong metal machines in 1859? We sometimes don't appreciate just how smart and technologically advanced people were in the past. They didn't have computers and cars, but they had different technologies, and they used math and science to design and build impressive structures and machines. By 1859, the Industrial Revolution was already well underway in Canada, and Hamilton was home to a growing number of factories. Our engines were actually built locally by the Garchor Brass and Iron Foundry in Dundas. Garchor used a technique called sand casting to create very strong metal parts capable of exerting great forces and withstanding great pressures. We're going to approximate his methods with things we have at home. The first thing you're going to need is an adult. You will need their help for this activity. You're also going to want to make sure to wash your hands thoroughly before we start. Then you'll need a baking sheet to work on and contain spills, a flat-bottomed plastic container, enough brown sugar to fill that container, some chocolate, we're using chocolate chips, but you can use melting chocolate or even some chocolate bars, a bowl of cold water, cold water from your tap is also fine, some tape, a spoon, a bowl to melt your chocolate in, and a heat source. I'm using an electric pressure cooker, but you could also do this in the microwave or over a double boiler. The last thing you're gonna need are some objects, hard, solid objects to make impressions in your casting sand. I'm using wooden blocks of my daughter's, but you can use whatever you have at home. Just make sure to wash them thoroughly before you use them. The first thing we're gonna do is arrange our blocks in the container. You wanna make sure you don't overcrowd the container. You don't want them too close to the edges or to each other. Next, we're gonna scoop the brown sugar so that it settles all around each of our objects. You may need to slightly reposition your objects as you do this, if they move, and that's okay. You'll want to pack the brown sugar tightly around your objects, making sure to keep adding more until your container is full and packed. In 1859, instead of this delicious brown sugar, they would have used a mixture of molding sand, bentonite clay, pulverized coal, and water. But I think this is going to taste better. Our engine parts would have been first made from wood too. A pattern maker would have carved each piece out of wood so that, they, so that they could be cast in sand, just like we're doing now. So as you pack in the sugar, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you come flush with your container and that as much as possible, you level your brown sugar so that this top is completely flat. And you're gonna understand why we wanna do that in just a moment. To level my brown sugar, I'm just gonna give it a scrape with this ruler. And now comes the tricky part. We're gonna take our tray and put it on top of our container and then invert the entire thing. Now, if you've done this well, packed it tightly and made sure to level it, you should be able to lift the container off and that mold should hold its shape. Now, we're gonna remove our pieces. The easiest way I've found to do this is to take some tape and make a tube with the sticky side out and then bend that into a ring, kind of like a handle. We can then take the tape and stick it right onto our object and lift straight up. What you'll be left with is a perfect impression of the object in your brown sugar, called a cavity. Now we're going to pour our chocolate. Make sure that you have an adult help you melt the chocolate and be careful not to overheat it. It shouldn't get hotter than about 40, 45 degrees Celsius or 110 degrees Fahrenheit. Also make sure not to get any water in the chocolate or it'll harden. I heated mine up earlier, so now it's perfect for pouring. We're gonna carefully take a spoon and ladle the chocolate into the mold that we created. In 1859, workers would have taken chunks of metal and melted them down at such high heat that they became a liquid. It would have been called molten iron, and they would have poured that into the cavity. We're using the chocolate. I think that we'll be satisfied with the results. Now, once you've poured your chocolate into the mold, you're gonna to wanna to put it in the fridge to cool down so it can re-solidify. Now we're gonna remove our chocolate from the brown sugar. It's okay if the sugar sticks a bit, that would've happened historically as well. Just brush that off with your hands or run it under cool water. And that's why we have the little bowl of cool water next to us. And if we put it under the water and give it a little rub, 
we're left with a piece that looks almost exactly like the block. Now, some of the chocolate might look a little bit different. And this would have happened historically as well. If you take a closer look at our engines when you come to visit, you can see that there are tiny little defects. Sometimes a little bit of the casting sand would have been left on the, on the piece. That would have been called an inclusion. Other times, little pockets of air would have been trapped in the metal. These would have been called pinholes. And there we have it. So you can just dry these off with a paper towel and you're ready to go. I don't know about you, but I have a whole new appreciation for this painting. What a trip! That little trip starts in Lake Ontario, works its way through the sand filter, getting all clean before traveling a kilometer to our pump house. From there, our massive steam engines pump that water under immense pressure to a reservoir five kilometers away and 60 meters in elevation. Then the water travels all the way back down through smaller and smaller pipes to the city of Hamilton until it comes out of your town. In total, that little drip traveled more than 10 kilometers. Well, I hope you had fun. Thanks for coming. Thank you so much for joining us today at the Hamilton Museum of Steam and Technology. I hope that you enjoyed learning about the trip of the drip with Philip. If you'd like to see more of our content, you can go on our website at www.hamilton.ca slash museums. On there, you'll be able to learn a lot more about our site's history and even go on a virtual tour where you can see our two 70 ton steam powered walking bean engines up close. There's also more programming video like Jerry the Muskrat's The Greatest Lakes Adventure and our world famous music video, What Does the Pump Say? where you can dance along at home. Thank you so much for joining us today and on behalf of the entire STEAM team, have a great day. Bye.